Welcome to A Brief Pause, a pet podcast where we talk about all things pet. This season is a special one where we're talking to the famous Dr. Cliff Favor, and this is a continuation of that conversation, as is every episode of the season. Uh, This episode, we're talking about anal glands. I know it's a weird, funky subject, but it's still quite controversial in the industry on what we should and shouldn't do and what they do, what they are, and why we mess with them if we mess with them at all. So we talked about ear plucking, you know, I had mentioned before I did a a YouTube video on ear plucking and anal glands. Um, but just a brief overview with the anal glands, the veterinarians go from the inside and the groomers go from the outside legally going from the inside is practicing veterinary medicine. So be aware that when your groomer says doing the anal glands, that that's what they're doing. They're pushing gently from the outside. Um, but briefly, yeah, when I say I did a YouTube video on it, it was for my, my company luxury groomer. We haven't done an episode on it here. Um, so briefly go over what that means. The anal glands a pretty common thing. Um, like I said, they used to do them at every groom shop, uh, all the time, but they don't anymore. Now it's a, well, some, some of them do, but I argue that they maybe shouldn't. Um, not every dog every time needs their anal glands done. Um, imagine like short hair dogs that never get groomed. They're fine. It's kind of what I tell people sometimes and they look at it a little bit differently. Um, but described, you know, now that we have a vet here again, describe, uh, what that is, why people thought it needed to be done, what the difference from going to inside and outside is. Um, and just the, describe us the, uh, the ins and outs of anal glands. Okay. Well, first of all, I think it's good to kind of start the history. You know, I, I think years ago, uh, uh, the veterinarians, for whatever reason, and it might have been a good intentions, it might be financial intentions, got where they would have clients bring their dog in once a month to express the anal glands. And, you know, reached a point there that, you know, sometimes that got costly and people were looking for alternatives. And a lot of the groomers said, well, you know, can you teach me? And so they ended up started teaching the groomers to, to do it. And so there was a switch there to go over to groomers because groomers would do it for free and the veterinarians charge for it. And so we had a switch where now the groomers are taking care of it. The big difference is, is to do an anal gland correctly, you have to go in rectally and you milk the gland between your two fingers. So you have a, 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 a back backing there that you're working against. Groomers can't legally do that because they've penetrated an orifice. They're working internally now. If they happen to rip the colon, now we got a bad problem and you're not trained to do that. Um, So what happens is groomers start doing them externally. Now, the problem with that is you have nothing to bring it up against. You don't have a wall on the other side. So I always tell my clients, it's like having a pimple in the middle of your face and you're doing this. You know, and what you're doing is you're, you're bruising and injuring the tissue. And what a lot of people don't realize, the dogs that have the most anal gland problems are usually the ones that are groomed most frequently. And I can't say it's a correlation or there is a correlation, but I don't know whether it's a causation, but that is something that you see on a regular basis on that. The anal gland itself is an apocrine sweat gland, basically, but it works exactly like we were talking about a cyst. A lot of times we get swelling at the opening, which is very small, or we get a concretion. So now there's no exit route uh, on that for the ones that get severe. In in a normal situation, the anal sphincter sits over the top and every time they have a bowel movement, that's the wall. And when they pinch off, they squeeze it out, everything works well. So it's definitely one of those things that I I talk about that if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, You know, if they're functioning fine, we should never touch it because every time we touch it, we potentially add inflammation or problem. But back to a problem area, when we get abscesses, it's usually because that opening swells shut due to concretion, due to swelling or whatever. And then just like the cyst, it starts growing. As it grows, it stretches the skin, which basically cuts down on the blood supply And now we've got a weak spot there. And literally you can look at it cross-eyed sometimes and they'll rupture um, because you thin that skin so much and and lost the blood supply that that tissue is actually becoming necrotic on on that. And and so once it ruptures, um, then most of the time it ruptures um, externally, it can rupture internally. And then you got a really, really bad problem. And I've seen some cases that would 
turn your, your, your toes up. I actually had one that was draining anal gland uh, material out the knee uh, on that. Um, we had no idea what the source of it was until I went there surgically. And there was about a four inch patch from the anal gland all the way down to the knee that had secretory cells producing anal gland material on this dog. Uh, um, I like to say it was a horrendous surgery to try to put that back together because I literally had to take out about four inches uh, from one end to the other on that. Wow. But the, wow. the problem when they get to that point is they're very, very vulnerable to trauma. And so a lot of groomers say, well, I just feel them. Okay, well, if it's about ready to rupture and you just feel them, you maybe just ruptured them internally. It's kind of like having a blowout on your tire. If it blows out in the center or on the inside and you blow it out, then you own it. Um, you know, and the problem is, is most groomers don't check anal glands when they walk in the door. So I, I hear this all the time that, you know, I, I checked the dog in this morning. Mrs. Jones said everything was fine. And at 10 o'clock, I, I went to do the bath and we found matted hair and I shaved it and there was an anal gland abscess. And the first thing that happens when you talk to Mrs. Jones, she says, what did you do? Because she doesn't understand the process on that. Now, did the groomer cause that? No. She maybe exacerbated it because she squeezed it or, or, or she messed with it uh, on that. But most of the time it's been there in, in advance, but that's a hard one to convince an owner of. They want to place blame on, on the overall, you know, and if you go to a veterinarian, there's times that I've had veterinarians say, well, they must have, you know, ruptured them because they squeezed them. There again, you know, I, I don't know what that would look like in a court of law, but I don't really want to go in, go into that because that's a matter of how good your lawyer is uh, on the overall. Those of us that are in the industry know that you don't create an abscess overnight and it, it doesn't just rupture um, uh, casually. It's already going through a process that, that's heading in that direction. So, you know, I tell groomers, you know, it's not worth the liability because if you get an anal gland abscess and you get accused, number one, going through the the legal system, you don't want to do that. But if you go to pay for it, a lot of times that's five hundred or thousand dollars out of your pocket. And when you you look at your profit margin on grooming, that's a heck of a lot of grooms that you're going to have to uh, pay for or do to make up for the cost of that that surgery or taking care of that client. So why not just hands off, let the the, the veterinarians do it and do it right, uh, and let them take the liability on the overall. And, and like I say, I don't even want you squeeze them personally because that's a liability. Once you touch them, then you're responsible for anything that goes on there. Um, so. Yeah. And then on the flip side of that, I mean, I think it's good to know, you know, when groomers and vets work together. So the groomer can be that first one setting eyes on these things and see what's going on. I remember one time years ago, there was a Shih Tzu I was grooming. And once you got some hair off, it had this hole in its neck and trying to figure out what on earth that could be and whatever. And so I checked the mouth and it sure enough, it had an abscess tooth that was draining like down here out of its neck. Right. But we're seeing that dog first. Oftentimes if they're a once a month client, this and that we'll see stuff um, before, and then you can really team up with the veterinary and say, Hey, I found this now the dog gets to go to the veterinarian. So we're, you know, putting the eyes on the animal more often is something uh, that vets don't have the um, luxury doing, right? They're not looking at this dog every two weeks or a month or this and that. So when a groomer knows enough uh, to work with a veterinarian and look at the animal and know when something needs to be seen by a veterinarian, that's really helpful. Um, but trying to do veterinary medicine is, is that gray area. You have to be really, really careful. Yeah, and, and um, of doing, you, you know, groomers are, are 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 probably one of the important jobs you do as a pet advocate. You're you're there to find things, and you do see them on a regular basis, and you see things quite frankly um, when they're wet or with the dryer that I would never see in an exam. I, I mean, I had dogs walk in with a tumor you couldn't hold in both hands uh, on the underbelly on a malmute, and the owners didn't even know it was there. Um, you know, where you guys will see those things. And a lot of times it can prevent them from getting so far down the road. You know, and one of the things I'm a big advocate of is every dog that walks in the, a salon should have a pre-exam. And, and I, I use that exam loosely. Let's call it a pre-observation. 
Um, you know, you need to go over that dog and, and check, I call the sentinel areas, check the ears, check the mouth, check the anal region, check their feet. Um, these are all areas of prepuce and the, the vaginal area. These are all areas you could potentially have a problem. And then ideally, I like to take a, a forced air uh, dryer and go through and just look for anything else, sores or cuts or bites or, or whatever. It, it's easier to find something then and refuse the groom and send them to the veterinarian than to call Mrs. Jones up in, in the, her busy part of the day and say, we got a problem, you need to come get your dog. Um, you know, So it's important to do that. And, and I think one of the things that groomers have to learn too, there's a time and a place to refuse a groom. If you've got a bad infection, it's much easier to get it to the vet and let them deal with it and let them take responsibility of it versus you do something that may cause something that you don't, you may not even understand the consequences of it um, because that's not necessarily what you were trained in uh, on that. So it's better to let the veterinarian do it, let him put, he or her put their name on it and then come back and, and do it if, if they say that everything's okay. Thanks for listening to A Brief Pause and make sure to listen to the next episode to continue our conversation with Dr. Favor.